coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm still at Dublin, so you can. Okay, um, so uh, uh, Dr. Becker is uh, an assistant professor in sociology at um, University College Dublin. Um, but as I understand, maybe um, on her way to Heidelberg, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is very, very exciting to be able to announce this. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Becker uh, studied at uh, Cornell, uh, Oxford and Yale, where she received her PhD. Um, she's a, a cultural sociologist interested in questions of inclusion and exclusion with research centering on experiences of Muslims and Jews in Europe and the US. Uh, her first book is about to be published. We want final proofs right now, which is very exciting in um, uh, June or July of this year called uh, Mosques in the Metropolis, Incivility, Caste and Contention in Europe. Uh, and that's with um, University of Chicago Press, uh, I think. Um, okay, I, mean, I realize that Elizabeth, we haven't, I haven't actually um, talked about how long you should speak for, but speak for as long as you would like, essentially. Uh, and I, then, ask I won't speak too long. Yeah, and then we'll, then we'll have some questions, uh, some time for questions thereafter. Um, we will, if it's okay, record the actual talk itself. Um, with the possibility of putting it on our um, uh, website at a later date. But I think what we'll do is stick to our normal practice of only recording the talk and not the discussion, okay. uh, just so people feel as um, disinhibited or rather as properly inhibited perhaps <laughs> as they, um, as they uh, might in uh, um, uh, asking questions and uh, joining in discussion. So, um, Elizabeth, I'll hand over to, to you. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. This is not a, a, a full presentation or anything, but um, just so you can see a couple of the quotes that I have, and I will show you a couple of short clips throughout. So just let me know if you can see this and if it's fine. The PowerPoint, which is very basic. OK. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a sort of conceptualization of Muslim and Jewish positionality in Europe. And this is part of a broader project of mine, which is uh, my first book project, Mosques in the Metropolis. And what I want to focus on, on is the idea of the Abrahamic stranger, Jews, Muslims, and the question of Europe. So essentially looking at the positionality of Jews and Muslims, both present and past, and how this sheds light critically on what Europe is and what Europe can potentially be. Actually, you don't need this yet, but I will come to this in a moment. Um, so as you probably, many of you know, the Muslim question that, that has come to a head in the 21st century, in a lot of ways, it echoes the Jewish, so-called Jewish question of the 20th, 19th to 20th century in Europe. This came up often in the work of Jewish German thinkers and Jewish European thinkers more broadly, like Hermann Cohen and Hannah Arendt. Both the so-called Jewish question and the so-called Muslim question pose Jews and Muslims as somehow contrasted to or contradicting Europe, both politically and geographically. So reflecting on Hermann Cohen's uh, Jewish ethics in which he talks about this idea of Jews as strangers, Benjamin Pollock, a scholar of Cohen's thought writes, quote, so the stranger becomes the mediating concept of Europe. It's this idea of the stranger, specifically the Abrahamic stranger. So again, Muslims and Jews in contrast or in relation to a both Christian and secular Europe as the mediating concept of Europe that I want to focus on today. So I'm not the only person who has thought about this or, the, or thought through this uh, at all. Uh, and we have one such person here who I'll mention in a few moments, but um, what I, I believe I innovate in doing is bringing Jewish thought in the 19th and 20th century, mostly German Jewish thought, but also Jewish thinkers who migrated from other parts of Europe during World War II and Jewish contemporary Jewish thinkers like Richard Sennett into conversation with the experience of marginality and inequality that Muslims experience in Europe today. And so I turn to this thought as a sort of critically productive lens to think about Europe and to think about why Europe remains uncomfortable with its ethno-religious minorities, both Muslims and Jews in different ways, again, historically in different ways, which I won't talk about 
in depth today and also in the present in different ways, which I hope I will point to in my uh, ethnographic piece a bit later on. So there are a lot of thinkers that I draw on. You don't need to remember them, but if you're interested, um, including Herman Cohen, Georg Zimmel, Walter Benjamin, Hannah Arendt, Zygmunt Bauman, Ernst Bloch, Hans Jonas, and Richard Sennett. I could draw on more potentially, although this is probably too many, but here there are, as some, some have, have critically brought up in conversations about my book, these are very different thinkers. Some are thinking from a Jewish religious perspective. Some see themselves as culturally or ethnically or part of a sort of community of Jewish thinkers. Others don't identify necessarily as Jewish, but are identified by European society as Jewish, like Georg Simmel. Um, but what I think is interesting and what I believe from reading their work is that this idea of Jewishness and what it means for Europe informs their thought in very different ways. Today, I will then focus on the stranger. And what I mean by the stranger really draws directly from Georg Simmel's work. Um, so a stranger is not a wanderer, he writes. This is the quote I have up. He who may come today and leave tomorrow. He comes today and stays. He's a potential wanderer. Although he has not moved on from the society, he has not quite shed the freedom to stay or go either. He remains within a specific place, but he has not always belonged to it. And so he carries into it qualities that could not, do not, could not belong there. Zimla actually goes on to assert that the history of the European Jews offers a classic example of the stranger. And it's this kind of in-between insider-outsider status that he's talking about that I will, I will come back to. But I'm, again, not the only one who comes back to this. So sociologist Sigmund Bauman comes back to this in his own work when he's writing about what had happened during the Holocaust and how something so fracturing and so horrific could occur. And he also turns to the idea of the stranger. Now, what Bauman says is that the stranger's unredeemable sin is the incompatibility between his presence and other presences fundamental to the world order. His simultaneous assault on several crucial oppositions, instrumental in the incessant order, effort of ordering. It is this sin, which throughout modern history rebounds in the constitution of the stranger as the bearer and embodiment of incongruity. The stranger is, for this reason, the bane of modernity. So the stranger takes on an even more kind of negative position, which makes sense if you think about Zygmunt Bauman's own position fleeing from the Nazis. Um, but what I find interesting in his work is how he turns to the Jewish exemplar again of the Zemelian stranger. He has this specific theory of the so-called conceptual Jew, the prototypical ethnic, religious, cultural stranger that's forged by modern European society as it seeks to order itself um, and it seeks to kind of get rid of in-betweenness or threshold spaces and those that inhabit them. I argue that Muslims are similarly ethnic, religious, cultural strangers, both forged by and in relation to European society today. And that they, like Jews before them, and somewhat again beside them, reside as insider outsiders in the societal imaginary of Europe and particular societies for instance, Germany, which is what I will focus on in my talk. So now I'm going to give the briefest overview ever of, so that I the action I have in systems. My research was carried out uh, in two mosques and in relation to those mosque communities. It wasn't all the mosque, but my, uh, my interlocutors came mainly from these two mosques and their broader communities. As Sometimes the neighborhoods surrounding the mosque, such as um, by Köln, where the Scheidlich Mosque, which I'll talk about today, is located in Berlin. And these mosques, I argue in my book more broadly, are also kind of threshold space spaces, right? They're in between the public and private life. They're a place where European Muslims are negotiating their identities, where they're creating communities, where they're going to these experiences of exclusion. So they are very much agentive spaces. I want to point this out because what I will focus on now is not agency, um, but a lot of my work focuses on the agency of those who are put into positions of marginality or subordination culturally. Um, but today I'm gonna focus more on that positionality itself. 
So I carried out research from 2013 to 2017 in these mosques. And I will just talk about the Shade Lake Mosque. The second one is in the UK, the East London Mosque in London. Um, but today I'll just focus on the Shade Lake Mosque. So at the beginning of my research, 2013, when I met a Shade Lake community member, Harun, at the Jewish Museum Berlin Cafe. Um, and he was born in Berlin. I met him at Shade Lake and was working on his PhD as well as working as a tour guide at this museum. He's still working as a tour guide at this museum. So we sat in this courtyard that is often termed or termed by the museum itself, a sukkah made of glass and steel, which is really interesting and evocative because it actually creates shadows of Jewish stars, but it's this very modern structure, right? Bright and open. And we talked about the Jewish museum and his work within it. Now, I wanna just give you a little bit of a background on the Jewish museum. Um, the Jewish Museum, there are two parts to it. There's the museum itself, and then there is something called the Academy of the Jewish Museum Berlin, which hosts more public facing events and a lot of sort of semi-academic or fully academic events as well. At the time that I met her, and again, this is in 2013, there was a conflict over the Academy and the representation of Jewish life in Germany, as well as a conflict over what should and shouldn't take place within the museum. So the museum itself was this kind of urban institution, it still is, struggling with its space and its place in contemporary Berlin, Germany, and Europe. The museum has had a lot of controversies over the last few years, and some I'll point to are, uh, which we can, we can watch the short videos <laughs> about, which are interesting. Um, so the first one was this controversy over, I wanna see if I will stop that share and share this other kind of film with you over this circumcision. In a moment, I'll talk to you more about um, the circumcision ban that took place in Germany and then, then that was essentially reversed. And this is when this circumcision exhibition happened. Um, this opening this discussion about what it means in Europe um, and whether it's sorry, a religious right or whether it is um, Etc. These different tropes are used in talking about circumcision. As you can see the video, right? Can everyone see the video? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> So the Jewish Museum has not been, which you probably can tell from here, a sort of neutral space, or it's been a space where a lot of these controversies play out in really interesting ways. Now that was in 2013, and that was one of the, the more controversial um, exhibitions that had, and part of the reason was because it really brought Jewish and Muslim experiences together in the museum, and some critiques that it hadn't focused exclusively on the Jewish experience. Um, now there were other exhibitions such as one called Shershev Mafem. I cannot speak French, <laughs> but it, um, I'll show you that short, like 20 second video as well. And that was about the head coverings of both Jewish and Muslim women. And it had a lot of the same sort of critique from mainstream German society that it wasn't really focused, oh, sorry. Um, that it wasn't really focused exclusively on Jewish life and that you know, it was bringing into question whether the museum should be a place for these broader conversations or exclusively conversations about Jewish life present and past. Noch immer gilt in vielen Kulturen das Haar als zu intim, um es öffentlich zu zeigen. Ob Perücke, Burka oder Ordenstracht, das Jüdische Museum in Berlin wirft einen Blick auf die weibliche Verschleierung, ihre Tradition und religiöse Bedeutung. Zudem liefern jüdische und muslimische Künstlerinnen ihre Visionen zu diesem aktuellen Thema. Cherchi la femme, ein Beitrag zur Stellung der Frau zwischen Religion und Selbstbestimmung. That was obviously in German, so, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the, um, the types of 
conversations that are happening. So what that led up to was the most controversial event at the Jewish Museum. And this was in 2018, so not that long ago, and it was called Welcome to Jerusalem. And what it did was portray Jewish, Muslim, and Christian claims on the city. This became very critiqued both by um, the Israeli government and, and Germany's largest Jewish body, which is the Central Council of Jews in Germany. And the argument relates to this, which you can see here in this larger box. The argument was that the Kaaba and, uh, I'm sorry, not the Kaaba, not the Kaaba. Um, the, the, the argument um, was that having the portrayal of Muslim religious sites, which you can see oh, sorry, here, as larger physically than Jewish religious sites, which you can see here, um, showed a sort of privileging of Muslim claims on the city. And so, uh, yeah, so this became kind of one of the, the breaking points of the Jewish Museum. This sort of at the same time that this happened, there was an event held at the Jewish Academy, which um, brought together people talking about, academics talking about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, including one very well-known BDS supporter. And that was kind of caused this outrage about whether BDS supporters should be allowed in the museum. So there are many conversations, which we could talk about later, happening here. There are conversations about the city and the institution of a museum in Berlin and what that means. There are conversations about Europe and its own kind of pluralism. There are conversations about the role of Israel and the relationship between Germany and Israel. But many see this as the moment, like this 2018, 2019, this is the time um, in which the Jewish Museum somehow collapses and the director steps down as does the head of the academy in the Jewish Museum. So I want to bring you back to Harun, who's sitting in the Jewish Museum. Um, and this kind of what comes up in our conversation, which relates to a really aptly titled article that was published in the New York Times after all of these controversies. And the title was, What and Whom Are Jewish Museums For? And Tarun comes back and he basically asks me what and whom are religious for. These questions are questions that have come up in relation to the Jewish populace, he says, and now we're coming up in relation to the Muslim populace. Harun's conversation with me focused almost exclusively on the circumcision ban because that had happened recently. And so what happened was a year before meeting him, so in 2012, the Cologne Appellate Court ruled that circumcision constitutes bodily harm. This followed a young Muslim boy's complications from the procedure in Cologne. Now this was articulated in a language of liberal rights rather than religious obligation, with the argument that circumcision essentially violates an individual's autonomy over his body. Facing stark critique from across the globe, Germany eventually um, passed legislation that agreed to accommodate circumcision. So they didn't exactly reverse this. What they did was pass legislation that's saying, if a doctor is present um, and the child is under a certain age, this can happen in Germany. But the months of discord that followed really spoke to this positionality of being in but not fully of Europe. And one that is shared in the, this kind of contemporary case by Muslims and Jews. So circumcision was often described in the news as disfigurement of the individual's body. And Harun countered this by saying that it actually is part of a larger configurations of bodies and, and shared religious traditions. In his words, he said, quote, what was very significant is that this practice was portrayed as barbaric. And okay, now we teach you what to do. We Christian society, we German society, we have overcome certain barbaric traditions. We have modernized with the enlightenment. We have left things behind. We've overcome this. So now it's time for you guys to, you know, arrive here. Again, pointing to this position of not being, having fully arrived, but also nested within this concept of the barbaric and its juxtaposition with modernity are associations not only with brutality, but also the twin characteristics of, of incivility that are assigned to who I term the Abraham and foreignness at once. Benjamin, um, Walter Benjamin, who's one of the Jewish thinkers I use in my work, talks a lot about how in modernity, there's this turn away from threshold experiences. 
reflecting the ambiguity of strangers and their strange practices as Anne explains that in modern life, these transitions become unrecognizable. So Muslims and Jews in this, in this moment in Germany both become cast as belonging to both another place and another time. Now Muslims and Jews are often portrayed at odds with one another because of Israel, Palestine, but here they're collapsed into a single stranger. And it is this language of strangerness that Haruman uses himself. He says, quote, the anti-Semites, they were actually kind of happy and also the anti-Muslims. You know, they were like, these are the two strangers in our society. And now we have one case where we have the two strangers in our society together. For them, it was the perfect chance. And he goes on to describe basically how it was an opportunity to cast Muslims and Jews as not fully part of, of German society. Now, uh, um, a great academic who's here in Berlin, Shirin Amir Moazami, argues that it's not only the legal ruling in this case, but the surrounding secular discursive framework centered on individual freedom and integrity that elucidates the incomprehensibility of a collective Islamic or Jewish moral framing of circumcision. At first, the dominant language and affect of the secular body prevailed, focusing on medicalization and liberal rights. But this further marginalizes embodied religious traditions that do not shy away from pain. So as she argues, there's this sort of obsession with how it causes pain to the child. In the words of James Holston here, civility's idioms of inclusion and consensus create habits of the public which entrench citizenship's inequalities. So this grappling for a coherent body of the citizen, the German citizen, rather than a cohesive body of citizens that includes Muslims and Jews, reveals the incongruities of the European nation state and these hierarchies of belonging or not fully belonging. To critique this debate through an Islamic or Jewish lens where circumcision is not primarily about, but nor does it evade pain, is to call forth the vitality of obligation rather than individual rights in shaping the pious or cultural body here as at once metaphorical. In Flesh and Stone, Richard Sennett opens a new possibility for solidarity through the recognition of pain in both the self and the other that can instead create cohesion beyond any single community. So he talks about arousing sympathy for those who are other. It can occur, he says, I believe, by understanding why bodily pain requires a place in which it can be acknowledged and which its transcendent origins become visible. Such pain has a trajectory in human experience. It disorients and makes incomplete the self defeats the desire for coherence, the body accepting pain is ready to become a civic body sensible to the pain of another person, pains present together on the street. And some have argued, although he, he is from a really interesting background, I have um, sort of mixed Jewish communist um, background, but he often draws on kind of other Jewish thinkers and these kind of traditions throughout modern thought. But, Perhaps most importantly, this sensibility to pain that he talks about defeats the desire for coherence, arising from this, I would argue, dangerous modern myth that creates and yet casts thresholds or in-between spaces or experiences of in-betweenness, like that of the stranger, as threats to the order of modernity, as Zygmunt Bauman argues. So turns to me and he really laments the loss of the opportunity for Jews and Muslims to work together here because what happened was not that they worked together what happened was actually that there was such outrage that after the Holocaust Jews could be outlawed from circumcising from the whole international community essentially not just the Jewish community um, that there was a kind of quick need to to change or amend this decision and a lot of the Muslims that I spoke to in Berlin spoke about this, this inequality in, in that Muslim, sort of Muslim positionality wasn't taken into account. And they argued that if it had happened to a Jewish kid, this would have never, like if, if the Jewish kid was the sort of exemplar, it would have never gone to the courts. But it was because it was a Muslim child who could be seen as sort of a threat or his practices a threat to European society. And in this way, although um, there, are, there is a sharedness here, and for Jews, of course, there is also like a time pressure because you have to be circumcised on the eighth day. That, that was not there for Muslims, so they did organize quite rapidly. Um, there, there are a lot of 
differences that we see here in the positionality of Muslims and Jews today. He points this out, I want to point this out because I'm not collapsing and saying that Jews and Muslims have the same experience, um, but that there are these overlaps both historically and in the present of being in between and as sort of an incomplete citizen. So he talked about how this was unfathomable for the Jewish community, but on the Muslim side, we've had so many experiences, he says, over the last few years with mosque building, with halal from the majority society, that everything is a problem. And so this was kind of like another problem we had to overcome. Now, he terms this the secondary placement of Muslims in, in Germany. For instance, he goes on to discuss the idea that, um, or the reality that Jews have police protection in synagogues for uh, understandable reasons, but that Muslims are themselves securitized by police in mosques. And he points out other uh, differences. Interestingly, he starts to talk about how while Jews sometimes share this position with Muslims, share discrimination um, as there has been rising anti-Semitism in recent years again, um, at the same time, they're sometimes seen to represent Europe itself. And so it's this shift back and forth. In one widespread narrative, Jews are seen to represent the body of Germany and Europe more broadly and its vulnerability to Islam. Now, Jews in, in Germany have become institutionally recognized in the same way as churches, which is complicated, but mosques have not. This is something else that he and many of my interlocutors pointed out. But in this narrative, anti-Semitism becomes perceived as a threat against the nation state. If you're seeing Jews as part of kind of a Judeo-Christian heritage, in history. Now, Anya Topolsky, however, traces the notion of the Judeo-Christian, demonstrating that it emerged not as inclusive of Jews, but actually a supersessionist concept, suggesting Judeo as temporally proceeding and then replaced by a supposedly morally superior religious form in Christianity. The way that Harun describes the differentiation between Jews and Muslims similarly sounds like a, a kind of supersessionist term in social but not theological terms, because he notes the role of the elite in Germany in constructing the true extreme other as Muslims. Now, this has been seen in many kind of popular culture instances. One of the most famous is a book written by Thilo Saritzin called Germany is Undoing Itself, which essentially argues that, that Muslims, while well, Arabs and Turks have really bad genes that are, that are leading to the undoing of German society. What was disturbing about this is not that he wrote this book, or that's disturbing, but more disturbing is how popular it was. It was a national bestseller. Many came forward and said, he's daring to say what he think. Um, and in these kind of opinion polls, I don't know how representative they really are, but you were getting like 10, 20% support. So disturbing levels. He went on to, um, so he was demeaning Jews as well in his early talks about the book, although the book focuses more on Muslims, but then he went on to kind of take back what he said about the Jews because of, of the way this was portrayed and um, the responses he got in society and really focused on Muslims. And so it, he goes on to publish an even more provocative book called Hostile Takeover, How Islam Prevents Progress and Threatens Society. Um, but there's this idea that there is a red line as Harun puts it in our conversation regarding anti-Semitism in Germany. Now, although there are rising levels of anti-Semitism Something else problematic is happening here in relation to Muslims and Jews, which is that Muslims are becoming blamed for the rising levels of anti-Semitism. Now, this, this is everywhere. I keep talking about the New York Times. I promise I don't just <laughs> take things from the New York Times. But there was a piece that I remember coming across by Jochen Bittner, who is a German journalist and quite well known, called What's Behind Germany's New Anti-Semitism? And it really equates acts of violence perpetrated by a small minority of ethnically Arab youth to a so-called Muslim problem, evidencing this universalizing tendency to label both incivility and threat as Muslim. And this idea of a new anti-Semitism is really problematic. It isn't that there aren't different forms today that emerge, there are. This often connects to anti-Zionism, um, and in Middle Eastern populations that have migrated in more recent years. And it alludes to a transformation by a sort of emergent Islamic left rather than an ethno-nationalist European right who are seen to kind of espouse the classical anti-Semitism 
But what is really difficult or really damning here is that this becomes assigned to Muslims writ large. And while all of the statistical evidence, all of the reports, the police reports, the Bundestag reports, they all show the vast majority of violence against Jews in Germany is carried out um, by right-wing white nationalists or white extremists. They often talk most, however, about the Muslim problem and the increasing threat that Muslims face or Muslims pose to Jews in Germany. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, that there isn't an anti-Semitism or a strand of anti-Semitism among certain populaces, but this kind of false projection of new anti-Semitism that's really anything but new, um, instead goes to kind of further this position of being inside and yet outside of Europe for Muslims. Now, it appears politically savvy to externalize this problem, I think, because rather than grappling with the idea that in spite of all of its educational initiatives, all of its public initiatives, all of its government initiatives um, that have really focused on stamping out anti-Semitism in Germany, and there has been a huge investment into this, and you can see some of it in Ezra Ozerek's work, but there's just this huge investment into creating or to, to, to stamping out anti-Semitism um, and creating a less discomfort and um, hatred towards Jews, and yet it survives in sort of significant pockets of the country. But instead of sort of contending with how and why, and some of the historical contributions, I think, to why, why Jews don't still fully belong to Germany, they really focus on the stranger, again, here, um, here, Muslims. And Richard Sennett now talks about the stranger as well. He says that sometimes as with the Pegida marchers, so Pegida, if you don't know, was this right-wing phenomenon, I mean, it's a group that um, marched against it's the patriotic Europeans against the Islamicization of the West. They kind of collapsed as we saw in Bre some of the, the Brexit campaigns, this collapsing of immigration, Islam, Europe, and um, into one sphere, but Pegida focused quite a bit on Islam. And Richard Sennett says that sometimes as with the Pegida marchers, images of the strangers define exactly how a people does not want to see itself, as in the portrait in Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. And so the image of the Muslim as anti-Semitism's new face in post-war Europe is akin to that portrait. It's really a false cover, I think, for a metaphorical window mirror, which is a term that, that Walter Benjamin uses that I love. The idea that you can both see into and be reflected in something here of the Muslim the stranger that both reveals and reflects the untenable face of this exclusive European modernity. Now I will do something funny, or not funny, but and turn to a different um here I'm gonna unshare my screen for a second, or it's fine if it's still shared actually. Um I will turn to a different place briefly and, and end with this. And this place is um, where I grew up in Morningside Heights in New York City. And the reason that it's important is not because I grew up there, <laughs> but because it um, is a place where a lot of the Jewish German thinkers went in exile during before, during, and after the Nazi period, such as Hannah Arendt and pretty much a lot of the Frankfurt School. Um, and and when she migrated there, after she migrated there, Hannah Arendt wrote a poem to Walter Benjamin who didn't survive the Nazis called WB. And in this poem is just four lines, which you should see. Um, and she writes, dusk will come again sometime. Night will come down from the stars. We will rest our outstretched arms in the nearness, the distances. So I will briefly talk about kind of the stranger as having agency because I, I haven't, but we can also discuss that in the discussion. It's this combination of nearness and distance that I think characterizes the perspective of Jewish thinkers uh, as strangers in the European metro metropolis and also of Muslims today in the European metropolis. And it gives you this unique view of Europe, one that Zygmunt Bauman described as always on the outside, even when inside, examining the familiar as if it was a foreign object of study. And questions no one else asked, questioning the unquestionable and challenging the unchallengeable.
So being in this kind of societal threshold doesn't mean you don't have agency. It actually endows you with a sort of critical capacity to question, take it for granted assumptions about Europe. When you're excluded from national self understandings, you have to kind of grapple with where you belong, whether that's to the city, which a lot of my interlocutors found, to a religious or cultural traditions, to a history, um, et cetera. And from his own home in Morningside Heights, Edward Said actually once wrote of Muslims and Jews in Europe as strangers and unfortunate secret sharers on whom the shadow of Western civilization is cast. But my argument is that shadows of darkness, but of light turned inside out. So if we shift our perspective to the shadows of the enlightenment, the perspective of Muslims and Jews as strangers reveal neither the Jewish question nor the Muslim question as particularly interesting, but really the question of Europe, what it is, who it includes and excludes, how it reckons with its own plurality as the critical political, social, cultural, and ethical question of our time. So I'll stop. I think I talked too much. There, thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen too. Brilliant, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. That's wonderful. Um, we've